Back into content is for closers. This is our final penultimate. No, ultimate. I don't know the exact terminology on that, but this is the final episode of the 2022 year and and essentially season three. That's what we called this, right? Season three. Yeah, wrapping up season three. So season three. Adam is wearing his hat. It's cold outside. Yeah. Apparently, (laughs) it's very cold outside. I also had this hat. at my table when I started recording. So that had a lot to do with it, but very exciting episode today with Sonny bird. Um, and I think, uh, we get, we get into a bunch of different things with Sonny. He has been all over the place. Weirdly Carlton, I kind of mentioned the episode, but met him on Twitter, found out we live in the same city and then found out on top of that, we were both working at the same ad agency at the same time, um, uh, several years back. So like just weird layers. Yeah. Destiny. Yeah. Super, super, and I feel like the episode today, hopefully, uh, you know, showed some of that. It, we had a lot, of just very easy, casual conversation, uh, but but brought out, I think, a lot of helpful stuff around how Sonny is not an, an ad agency guy. His his one of his companies got acquired by an agency. Um, he's a pretty pure operator, and so for those of you who are running businesses and you know asking the question, what does it actually look like to use content? Uh, how do you plan on that? All those sorts of things. I think it's a good episode for that. What did you think about it? Oh, it's great, man. I, I absolutely loved some of the details that he got into, just the practical details at the end of the show where he's yeah. laying down like, this is what you should do if you're planning, if you're trying to you know formulate a little bit of a plan. And I loved how too, he, he kind of changed over time. Like he wasn't always a planning guy. Uh, he wasn't always trying to like figure out um, what all was going to happen that year. Um, but, you know, I think there's wisdom in that as you get older, starting to look out a little bit further ahead and say, you know, what, what are the things I have to get done by this quarter, the end of this quarter, and mm-hmm. then breaking that into smaller and smaller chunks until you get your daily, you know, your daily task list based off those goals. Yeah, it was great. All right. So what do you have for us in terms of, uh, in terms of herd takes? Yeah. So in case anyone forgot, we're doing hot takes, hot herd takes, you know, we can be controversial and get, and get more uh, view, <laughs> list, sound views bites to share. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone likes a good controversy. So, uh, <laughs> there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem with content in particular. There is the audience and there is the person that's creating that content. Um, and sometimes people are successful, not because they created great content, but because they already had an audience. And then sometimes right. people just get the audience because they create great content over and over and over. So what would your hot take be? Is it more important to work on building the idea for the content first and making sure it's good or just starting to publish and get, you know, a bunch of content out there to start building your audience? I guess I would say it depends on your objective, obviously, but my bent would be towards, you know, this is, is towards like just doing the thing, starting whatever it is, writing it, recording it. Um, and I've done that to in a bad way (laughs) multiple times. So I see the value of the other side, but, uh, for me, the process of making content has more to do with what I learn, which in addition to the actual outcome of it. And so, um, you know, if I'm just waiting until I have an audience or waiting until there's a, a perfect message, um, then I lose that benefit of, of the actual creation process. So I think it, if I had to pick, I'd probably pick pick that side. What about you? Gotcha. Yeah. So it, maybe it's not super hot of a take, but I think for me, I would place more of an emphasis on consistency around what the audience needs and wants. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, you know me on the opposite end of the spectrum. I like to have everything that I say and do be like very buttoned up and polished, and I hate the yeah. you know being exposed prematurely. Uh, with my right. ideas and things. So yeah, I like to kind of calculate a little bit more and theorize about what would, what would help, you know, move the needle the most and then start publishing based on that, that plan. Right. And I think there's a blend there, right? Because like, like I said, we've done in the past, my, my gut where we just start publishing and then we realize quickly, this is the wrong direction concept, whatever. And we've, 
we, I mean, we have tabled ideas, I'd say on, you know, from, from your perspective, um, that we just never really got momentum behind yeah. the main one I'm thinking of is content lab yeah. where, you know, and because we were trying to be so precise, so it's probably some blend in the middle, but I feel like what Sonny described today is a, is a great process for being able to have enough planning while taking action and yeah. testing what's, what's working at the same time. Like personally discovering what's, what's good and then kind yeah. of capitalizing on, on that publicly once you kind of suss it out and, and figure out what works. For sure. Uh, okay, so before we get to him, though, uh, this is our last Have You Heard of the Year. It's an important one. I feel like it's people are this, – this episode is going to be on the feed for a while. We should oh, note man. that. We're not going to be publishing uh, week one of January. We're working on season three and, and doing some prep work towards that. So this one's going to be on there for, for a while, Carlton. What are you going to leave the people with? Now that you put all this pressure on me, I'm like looking back through my list and thinking about changing it. <laughs> if you're not watching the video, Carlton's eyes started shifting yeah, super like, quick. Yeah, like yeah. now that you uh, put all that pressure on, no, um, yeah, you this will be to better, go? hopefully be better than like Costco, like like last week. Um, which which did you see that their stock actually went up by like five percent the day after? It's the herd effect. It's the herd effect. It's the herd bump. People heard. Yeah. Uh, anyways, I think it was related to something else. Uh, I'm going to go with principles.design. So mm -hmm. principles.design is basically an open source collection of design principles. So it's got everything from businesses that you know and love to businesses that you've never heard of. It basically just takes their design systems and takes their like design values and puts them all in one place in a really clean design. So sometimes if I'm like trying to think through an idea, I just go there and kind of like take a first principles approach to developing mm -hmm. the idea and looking at some of those core, those values around what, you know, what design should be and what really matters when it comes to the the base principles of design. So that's just one of my favorite sites for, for looking at design principles. How about you? What's your, that's cool. I'll have to check have it you out. heard of this last year? Yeah, I'll give mine. I uh, just one question on that. Is it, um, purely visual design? No, or it's actually, it... so it's actually like, words there's very oh, very cool. very little imagery on the entire site it's just okay. what are the core values around what good design should be so yeah you know things like accessibility or things like you know good design is you know fill in the blank yeah that's cool that's a good one to leave people with i feel like you can do a lot with that one um i'm going a completely different direction i mentioned it during the episode but i am currently reading a book called travels with charlie in search of america by john steinbeck yeah and it's not your normal steinbeck book it's essentially just his journal as he drove uh around the country with his dog in this souped up truck that he he put a camper on the back of essentially and i don't know why it's just complete like i can't go to sleep at night without reading this book. It's, it's just, uh, completely captured my imagination, maybe because we spend so much time on digital stuff, yeah. but yeah, if you're looking for a book over the holidays, something to kind of get some creative juices going, um, reading about somebody else going and doing this type of trip for me has been, has been enjoyable. So, so is it broken up by it like daily journals then, or how does he do that? It's not, it's, it's is kind it? of breaks it up loosely by like geolocation oh, okay but it's just a book so the chapters are not necessarily you know he just tells you his story so far uh, he just left the white mountains and is headed back down into maine so i'm cool. um, early but it's been really good so far hey well with that let's jump to the episode with sunny our guest today is an entrepreneur, marketer, and now small business investor named Sonny Bird, and I'm so excited to introduce you all to him. Sonny has led marketing for startups, co-founded and sold a company called Betabox, and now operates several e-com businesses. I met Sonny fairly recently on Twitter before realizing that we actually live in the same city and previously had been co-workers at an ad agency together but, but never realized it. And so uh, since we met, decided to have Sonny on to come share his story of going from marketer to founder to small business operator, how he leverages content to grow his various businesses. And most interestingly, I think we got into uh, Sonny sharing his detailed process of annual planning and I, he did it in a way and, and uses a format that I think you'll find very simple and very helpful, especially at this time of year. I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to know Sonny and have already learned a lot from him. Now let's get into this episode with Sonny Bird. All right, we've got Sonny Bird here on the show. Sonny, thanks for uh, for joining us, and thanks for withstanding the 
Riverside six seconds of awkward silence that we just went through together? It was truly painful, but we've made it through, you know, and I think we've been through a hardship together now that's yeah. going to set us up for a better conversation. So we're all we're stronger for it. because we're better yeah. for it. For those of you that don't, that don't know, in case for somebody from Riverside hears this for some reason, there is an unbearable six seconds that you have to wait once you start recording. And so you're just like making uncomfortable eye contact for that entire amount of time. Uh, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. We're really excited to have you on, Sonny. Uh, and obviously, you know, you and I just met in person, not, not a week ago, or I guess a week ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I've have talked on Twitter before and have like weirdly shared backgrounds in the past. Mm -hmm. So I guess, uh, before we get too deep, maybe you could just give the 32nd, you know, how, how do we get here? Uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I mean, 30 seconds. I'm just, um, I'm just a kind of a weird entrepreneur. Um, my path is not terribly linear. Um, I've done about everything you can do as an entrepreneur. I've, I've started like a venture backed tech company. I've started e-commerce side projects. I've worked in SaaS. I've worked in apps, uh, you know, any role that I've ever had has generally been around marketing and growth. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I've been a founder in my own right for a decade now. And most recently, you know, wrapping up the bio. I've gotten more and more interested in profitable internet-based businesses, um, owning multiple or acquiring these businesses and implementing systems to kind of keep them running. So right now I currently own and operate two companies um, while I'm kind of trying to grow that empire a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to t for the audience to hear from you because a lot of the people who listen are marketers who want to own multiple businesses or a business um, mm -hmm. or owners themselves who maybe own a business or two, but, but haven't been able to figure out how content can, you know, really materially affect their business. But just to, just to add some color to the background you just gave, Sonny and I got connected on Twitter at some point. I don't even really know how. And I was like, oh, this guy's cool. He's got some cool things to say. And over time kind of where is interacting with his, with his stuff and then realized, oh, he's in Greenville, which is weird. That's where I'm at yeah. in Greenville, South Carolina kept kept following kept seeing some things and then at one point you wrote about your experience working at Vayner Media and I was like wait what is this cuz no one here else that I know has worked at Vayner um aside from me and uh, and then it turns out we both were there at the same time so just lots of yeah. uh strange things uh that but that has been fun to to kind of get to know yeah. so we've got to be the only two Vayner alum in uh Greenville right I you would think we'd know, but Probably. who knows? There's, yeah, who knows. It, you know, just who under knows. rocks. Um, mm -hmm. So anyway, obviously with all of that as a background, you understand, you know, you have a unique perspective, I'd say on content. So I guess just generally, mm -hmm. how do you feel like content has uh, impacted the way that you operate, whether it could be starting a business or now running these two businesses? Um, how, how does your own content mm -hmm. production affect those things? I mean, my, my view of, one of my views of content is that, and as I've progressed as an entrepreneur, before I ever do anything, you know, because I'm a guy who thinks every idea sounds amazing. Every single idea, I'm like, I love it. I want to start that company, right? So I have to throttle myself. So, so what I do before I do anything in business, I spend a lot of time, like just kind of fleshing out and validating what the thing is. And pretty much it looks like socializing content. I write a lot about what I'm thinking about, what the idea is. I've got my own little kind of like weekly podcast where I say, hey, here's an idea that I'm working on. Um, it's literally just like a weekly personal journal. Like here's everything I did this week and here's what's going on. Yeah, I think like 12 people listen to it. So, so really blowing up, yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's one view of like, uh, I create and socialize content about any idea or business initiative on the front end to collect feedback and to see who in my network is interested and find investors or mentors or whatever the case may be. Um, the next view of content is that, of course, like all of my businesses are driven by content, whether it's uh, extensive email marketing content SMS, web-based content on our sites. Like I kind of view every online business as secretly a media production company. 
Right. Like you got to create ad campaigns every two weeks. You got to update your homepage every month. You got to have promotional stuff. You got to have an editorial calendar for the whole year. So I kind of just like content is kind of just the gasoline um, in my world. And then the last thing that, that, you know, has happened for me with content is it's only been about three, four months, but I took to Twitter and basically said, Hey, I'm here and I'm going to be sharing everything I can share um, pretty much daily. And that's a newer thing for me. Like I've always wanted to be a writer. That's just kind of like my deepest secret is like, sure. there's something in me that's just like, I want to be a writer. I'm not a writer. I mean, I'm not a qualified writer, but whatever. But um, yeah, I've been publishing threads about stuff that I do, what I'm working on, deals I've done, even real estate investments. I've just been putting it all out there. And um, that has been an incredibly profound experience. Like it's just been a magnet, like bringing people into my inbox. You know, even you, for example, like you and I would have never met had I not started my, hey, I'm a content guy on Twitter. Um, And that's what kind of brought us together. But it's got me an inbox full of DMs about opportunities, about ideas, whatever. So yeah, content is, uh, frankly, I sit around writing for like half my time right now. Really? Okay, Mm -hmm. so super interesting. All right, I want to pull on a few things there. So first, in the first uh, part of that, you talked about content being essentially like a network builder. You want to, you want to build your, or find your future yeah. founders, investors, et cetera. I always hear people talk about that. And I think it's something that if you're just listening and you haven't built a business yet, it's easy to be like, but how, like how, you know, mm-hmm. how do you just finding investors? Where are you just finding money? So walk us through that a little bit. Like, is it something where you're uh, bringing on people you already know are interested? How are you seeding that those platforms so that the conversations or the content that you put out actually brings you benefit back. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a tricky question because there's an element, you know, I've been, I've been hacking away for like almost 15 years yeah. at this sort of business thing. And so I, I don't have like a, you know, mega network, but I've got an established network and I've got people that I've known in various industries for many years. So I have that going for me. I have kind of like an intact network, but in terms of like, you know, literally how to use content to bring things to me, I think that people overthink content too much because I know I have for years, like I I was paralyzed from publishing anything because I'm like, oh, it's not good enough, or I'm not an expert or whatever. You know, let me give some concrete examples. Like, literally posted a thread that said, Hey, I've got a four and a half million dollar acquisition deal that hit my inbox. Here's all the reasons why I think it's interesting. If anybody wants to talk about it, hit me up. And just something as simple as that, because I don't need 10,000 people to see that. I need like three people to see that the right three people to see that. Yeah. And you know, and it worked. Right. And so that's, that's what I mean. Like, content gives me oxygen because, okay, I've got this idea for a deal, right? It's a $4 million deal, whatever. Within a day of posting that thing on Twitter, um, I had like five calls scheduled for feedback, for input, for, you know, how should you structure the deal? How should you lend against it? Like blah, blah, blah. So my analogy is that publishing something is like shooting up a bat signal um, on top of Gotham. It's like, you shine it out there. You don't know who's going to see it, but like you just you just need the one, you know, Batman right, to right. see it. Yeah, I love that. That's a good analogy. So maybe flipping from that, from the sort of the macro vision of what it means or how you use it. Now you said you spend half your day or, or whatever, yeah. a significant part of your day writing or creating. What's that process look like? Is it literally just like stream of conscious? Is it is it tied to specific goals you have? Like how how are you doing mm-hmm. that creation process? Yeah, so for me personally, it every morning for the first, you know, few hours of the day has a gradual progression from like really personal just kind of like life development type of work, mm-hmm. like journaling, stream of conscious journaling, what's on my mind like that that's how I usually start. And then I progress over the next couple of hours into more like 
professionally oriented stuff. So I'll give you a quick example. Today, I started out journaling. That's basically every single day. That's like my rule. It takes like 30 minutes, right? And then I switched over into some other writing that is actually kind of like creative writing. Just, I'm, just something I'm working on, has nothing really to do with my businesses, et cetera. And then went from there into publishing a thread about e-commerce and lifetime value of customers and how all the variables of the e-commerce formula come together, right? Mm -hmm. So the writing progressed from the journal up to like a very kind of professionally oriented e-commerce, e-compreneur thread that I put on Twitter. Now, the reason why I'm doing that is because I have an idea to make a 30 day email program that would be like a beginner e-commerce accelerator. Day one, this topic, day two, lifetime value, day three, conversion rate, right? And go on through like a 30 day progression. So what I did today for my content production is I said, let me write up day one of that 30 day sequence, publish it on Twitter. And then the tag is, Hey, I'm thinking about building this 30 day e-commerce accelerator thing, completely free, just one email a day for a month. And this is what would make up the first email of that sequence. What do you think? Right? So that's kind of a typical progression for me from journaling at 8.30 AM up through trying to get something useful or valuable out there in, in, in kind of my business lanes. Now I may go further from there and be writing up an email marketing promotion for my e-commerce business or a sure. sales template email for my B2B business, like whatever. I love that. So you're kind of, you're doing the personal stuff and then you're sort of developing and testing in real time the the longer term stuff as you're compiling it. Is that normal to like publish it and put it out on Twitter and be like, hey, give me your feedback? Or is that just because this this worked here for you? That's normal for me. Yeah. And you know, you don't you don't always get a ton of feedback. You don't always get a lot of engagement. But I think, you know, for Twitter specifically, the ethos of the platform is fueled by vulnerability vulnerability. Build in public share your work, share as you go. And so that just, it's, that's just kind of my approach to it. It's like, hey, I'm working on this. I'm like 5% of the way there. Here's what I'm thinking. You know, I put out an idea for um, like a paid uh, online kind of course that I would lead. And I, I literally wrote up like a brief of here's what this course would be. And it's kind of about 10Xing your e-commerce business. And here's the, the playbook put it on Twitter and was like, I think I would charge four or five grand for this. Anybody interested? And 15 people were like, I want to do this. Right. So, so I haven't actually kicked that off. It's not a business yet. I haven't taken anyone's money, but again, just evidence, like I'm continually just sort of putting ideas out there, testing different things, getting a little response, seeing where it goes. I love that. I love the idea of of uh, kind of testing and then seeding ideas in the future. And obviously you're able to do that now with, your your Twitter following is of a size where you can do that. I can't remember what is it three thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, three people? three thousand. Yeah, yeah. And so they're quite small. yeah. I mean, and, but they're all there for that reason um, to where you can you can engage with that. But like you said, that's that's been built over time. Okay, I would I would say the other thing that I really appreciate about you is obviously all of your thoughts on building a small business, operating it, etc. And then I also look at you as like a curator. Like sometimes, uh, especially. Earlier this fall, I was building out a list, which is how I use Twitter. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. really follow people. I mean, unless I like mm -hmm. personally know them, lists is my thing. And uh, I was trying to figure out who all the SMB folks I should follow are. So went to your, you and a bunch of other people's, but your profile and saw, okay, he's inter engaging or interacting with these folks. So on the yeah. consumption side, and it could be Twitter or not Twitter. What, what are you, um, what are you engaging with right now? That's making you better or who are you looking to? What are you seeing that's, that's helping you um, as you build? Yeah. Well, so organically I fell into a Twitter gang. So this was <laughs> unexpected, you know, like I didn't, I didn't know anybody on Twitter. Like I wasn't, I didn't have like a network on Twitter or anything like that, but it, it just kind of quickly evolved. It's like the same 10 people were loving my early posts and this little group emerged. And like, we literally are having like a holiday zoom call where we're all getting together. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, so that's been cool. So we, we all support each other. We consume each other's stuff and, and 
that's for example how if you you know looked at my twitter you might have found six or eight other people that i'm sort of affiliated with we're a little twitter gang um i love that i didn't even i've never heard of a twitter cartel but i'm all in on them now yeah yeah (laughs) but i mean in terms of, of the other content that i consume so i try to be very very careful about content consumption these days like i've spent I spent my all of my twenties reading shit online twenty four seven, right? So now I, I right, try to right. be real careful. I try to I call it so the content that I consume, I call it source material. Okay. I want it to be something that's like quite foundational that is going to kind of inspire me or serve as a jumping off point for something, as opposed to being like just consumption for personal entertainment purposes. So I'll give you a few examples. One of my most important I guess influences right now is a guy called David Perel or Perel. Sure, yeah, yeah, David yeah. Perel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's got this online school called Rite of Passage, and he basically publishes two emails a week of, you know, these are the things I'm thinking about, these are the things I'm learning about. And I just like him, I like his stuff, I like his vibe. So he's somebody I follow, like, and I consume very closely, and it inspires me and gives me ideas and such. Have you done the um, course? I have not done the course. Okay. I aspire to, and I may do it maybe this year in one of the future cohorts. I'm not sure. Yeah, it seems like, and maybe this is just his marketing that he does so well, but like graduating from that course, the alumni from that course, you immediately become a prolific content creator. Or I mean, that's that's at least what it appears like. It's uh, yeah. really, I think Packy McCormick did it. Uh, mm-hmm. A bunch of folks who are really just creating at a high level now. So that's, that's something uh, I'd like to do that as well. That's cool. What else? Anything, anybody else off the top? There's one podcast that I'm kind of just religiously hooked on, which is my first million. Oh, I think that that pod's probably quite popular with, I don't know, folks in our kind of headspace. But yeah, yeah, for sure. They're funny and it's like really entertaining, but I get a lot of inspiration from whatever they're talking about, or if they have a guest. Um, Like, I always find that after I listen to one of their episodes, I'm like feverishly wanting to like write down, oh yeah, this, you know, remember this thing, you know? And so I, yeah, I look for content that does that for me. So of course, like I follow Balaji and Naval, like anywhere they are on the internet. Um, And I read books, dude. Like I, again, source material. Right now I'm reading a book called Wonder Book by Jeff Van Meer. Van Der Meer. It's uh, an illustrated guide to writing fiction. So I'm always trying to have something like that around that's kind of inspiring me and driving some creativity. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, the yeah. My First Million stuff is a big, uh, a hu- obviously a huge fan over here. I feel like it's one of my goals in life. Um, I don't really necessarily want to be on the show, but if I were on the show, like, I would be so depressed and so disappointed if Sam didn't say that our conversation was badass at the end of it. Like, I feel yeah, like that's a yeah. stamp of approval that you you have to have. I yeah. just, what you just said reminded me, I'm reading, um, this was, I think, a recommendation from them or, or another show I saw recently, but uh, Travels with Charlie in Search of America by John Steinbeck. Have you ever mm-hmm. heard of that? Yeah, so it's, I have. It's not his... Uh, it's just like a memoir of when he took a trip around yeah. the country, and it's, it's Charlie's his story. dog, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's pretty funny and uh, and interesting, but I've uh, been been enjoying that for more of the the creative stuff. Cool. You know, um, if, you know, there's one other thing in that topic that was just mind blowing to me. I don't know if you've seen it, but um, they published a sort of edited version of Steinbeck's journal that he kept during the time that he wrote Grapes of Wrath. Have you oh, ever seen no. that? Dude, it's no, sick. Because, you know, of course, in hindsight, Grapes of Wrath, one of the most legendary books of our, you know, world. Yeah. And you get to see behind the scenes, literally his daily journaling of like what was going on, what was wow. on his mind. And he had bad days and days where he couldn't write. And dude, it's the Grapes of Wrath. Like it's one of the best books of all time. <laughs> that was a really yeah. good read. I know. I just wrote it down to, uh, to check it out. I feel like, and we talked about this, that experience is such a natural part of running, maintaining, operating, starting, whatever, um, really any type of business. But I think especially with internet businesses where we're not necessarily out moving, 
you know, cutting down trees. So there's more time in, to ruminate and be in mm -hmm. your head at, at times that, that peaks and valleys is something that, um, I've definitely struggled with. And I think, uh, it'd be interesting to read someone who, you know, is as prolific a writer as he is talking about that too. That'd, that'd be cool. You don't know yeah. what it's called. Do you, I could just Google. No, yeah, it's like yeah. journal of John Steinbeck during grapes of wrath and you'll find yeah. it. I'll find it and I'll link it, uh, in the show notes as well. If anybody else is interested. Um, cool. Super helpful. I guess, uh, content stuff aside, just you've got a million things going on. You've got the building, mm -hmm. you've got the e-com company, you've got other, uh, maybe real estate or, or business deals going on. What's mm -hmm. got you most excited for 2022? We're talking right now, second week of December, third week of December. Um, yeah. So just, you know, calendar's about to flip. What do you have on the horizon? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Adam, <laughs> because I just spent yesterday like three, four hours working on my kind of annual plan, um, hmm. which I've not always been a big planner. That's mm -hmm. never really been a thing for me because I feel like all the best things that have ever happened to me have come from not following a plan, but mm -hmm. taking curvy turns. But I guess maybe I'm a, a bit older now or something. So I've taken to planning and um, like David Perel publishes his annual reviews and his annual goals. So 2022, I am super looking forward to really optimistic and I've got a few different priorities um, that are sort of personal and business. Um, I mean, the table stakes is I think I'm going to double my e-commerce business. That's, wow. that's the goal. Like, to get us up north of million dollars in revenue in 2022. Okay. Because my company's very lean. You know, it's it's me part time and then one full time person, and that's mm -hmm. it. So if I can keep boosting those numbers, I would have like a really nice just scenario on my hands. Did, um, well, do and, you have to incur costs in order to do that, or is it that that will be the staff if you're now or at a million or at three million or whatever? Yeah, so that's the thing is I, I think to get us to a million next year, we can do that just with what we currently have Cool. without investing and in, you know, hiring a bunch of people and hiring an agency and yada, yada. Yeah. So that's kind of my prerogative these days. Instead of tr shooting for huge growth, I'm like, let's shoot for small, super profitable growth, kind of just maintaining what we've been building here. Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the goals for 2022. Um, another goal is... I really want to get into teaching somehow. And I don't know what that looks like, but I've taken a lot of online courses over the years that have been really transformative for me. And I, I have a hunch that I have some like e-commerce online university inside me. Absolutely. I tend to be a good teacher. And so I'm experimenting with um, starting in January, I've put together a group of e-commerce owners doing less than a million in annual sales. And we are all as a cohort going to double our own business mm -hmm. together. Very cool. And I just find that, I just think this is going to be such an interesting experience as experiment. And so the idea is that we will co-create a two X playbook as we go over the course of a few months and we'll each be sharing, Oh, well, here's what works on my side. And Oh, Hey, I added this email sequence and here's the results. Right. So we're all exchanging tactics, holding each other accountability for uh, accountable for doubling our business. So over the course of maybe the first two quarters of next year, I'm going to be facilitating managing that group, documenting everything we do. And I just think that's something interesting is going to happen. Right. I'm going to have a post. that's sure. like, Hey, me and six of my friends just doubled our e-commerce businesses, all getting north of a million in sales now over the last six months. Here's exactly what we did. Here's the playbook. Here's how we stuck together. And I think that could become like a regular cohort program, sort of like rite of passage, where it's yeah. like every six months, I've got a batch of 10 e-compreneurs doing less than a million a year in sales. And over the course of a six-month program with group accountability and mentorship, et cetera, we, we basically attempt to double your business. So that's, that's probably the thing that I'm most excited about trying to get that put together next year. I love that. Have you done a, a cohort 
thing, either participated or led one before? I, I never have. I'm just. Um, so in terms of participating, I've done um, ship 30 for 30. Okay. Which is, are you familiar with that? It's, it's they just kind of like get your writing, get your publishing yeah. every day for 30 days. And it, I, I really liked it. Actually, I think it was a really well done um, program. I didn't take full advantage of it, but it was really good. And I did the audience building course that came from Sahil Bloom in partnership with Demand Curve. And that was a cohort. You know, we all took the thing over the same course uh, period of time. That one was kind of funny. Like, it didn't, that one didn't need to be a cohort. I think cohort based education has like, is needlessly popular. Like, sometimes you don't need it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that, that course, I was like, just record these Zoom calls and send me a link. Course. Like, there's no, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's no point in doing it in sync. But, um, so that was kind of my yeah. follow up question, I think, is mm -hmm. like, we, um, so I've never done one, but my question or my flag or whatever that comes into my head is like, well, okay. What happened with you in the 30 for 30? You said you didn't quite take advantage of it. How do you, if you're not like, are you going to charge people or how are you going to get them to have some skin in the game to where like they, they stay and do it for the, for the course of the year? Yeah. My, my idea or my hope is that the first cohort, which literally includes me and my business as well, mm -hmm. six or eight of us that, that will, you know, that'll be totally free. Or, you know, maybe everybody will chip in a couple hundred bucks just to cover yeah. whatever, like some, some resources. But then if things go well, and I feel like there's a really compelling program and offer developing, I would, you know, for the, for the value prop that we're going to double your e-commerce business in three to six months. Yeah. I'd be charging like five to six to seven grand for something like yeah. that. Okay, cool. Yeah. And be yeah. totally worth it. But yeah, that, but the but the cohort thing, I think the cohort thing, albeit somewhat overblown and overrated, it is essential for accountability. Yeah. And so something like growing your business requires a lot of support and mentorship and advising. And so I think it lends itself to the cohort format because it's going to hold everyone accountable and keep you kind of week in, week out on track. Yeah, I we have a similar function in our business just by the nature of what we do, where some of the people who do shows with us um, probably wouldn't record if they weren't, you know, scheduled and paying for production and all these sorts of things. But I think creation itself could be, uh, well, it is, I guess, with 30 for 30, but creation and or growth, audience growth, like let's help each other grow our shows, our podcasts by X percent or our Twitter. I think those are interesting um, because they're super measurable and you can kind of have impact on on multiple of them uh, as you're going. And everybody's going through the same thing. So I, I like that. I like the idea a lot. Um, going back to your annual planning, and I know this is just mm -hmm. super detailed. I feel like I'm, I'm, I, I hate when people ask that, but I like, I like the way yeah. you do things. Okay. So how, what it. any specific format for that or any um anything that you found to be helpful? Yeah, actually there's something very specific that I found to be helpful. Um because again, this was never my strong suit. Like I I very much needed a paint by numbers system when I got started with this thing. So th there's a guy on Twitter called Girdley, G I R D L E Y. Yep. You ever seen him? Yep. I have. It, Great follow if you're in the SMB world. I think he's got 50, 60,000 followers. He published a thread like six months ago. And he was like, when I was younger, I didn't do enough planning and I wish I had. Now, today, this is how I put together a 10-year plan. And he walks you through how his quarterly plan for this quarter feeds into his plan for the year, which feeds into a three-year plan, which mm -hmm. feeds into a 10-year plan. And I'm yes. just like, okay. <laughs> like I've never done anything like that. So, yeah. so I started there and the first time, like, I remember the first time I started what was sort of a quarterly plan and the one, three, 10 year plan, it was like, I was blind. I had no idea what I was putting down. I'm like three years from now, um, I want to be making lots of money. I don't know. <laughs> like I'm, I want to have a second home. You know, it's like, you, you don't know really yeah. until you yeah. start pushing it. And so as I've, what I've realized for myself is that 
as you kind of keep iterating and reformatting this stuff, you get a little better and better to the point where it's quite helpful. So it's gotten to the point for me where every day where I'm on task, I'm literally hitting three main things which drive the quarterly goal, which drives the annual goal, which kind of feeds it. You know, I don't know about the three and 10 year element, but they kind of feed from there. So I've been able to get to a point where my daily inputs are supporting an actual. And so I actually, I made, and I'll, I'll send you, uh, well, if there's nothing like embarrassing, I'll send you a screenshot. But it's literally, a, it's a table on a slide that just says Q1, 2, 3, and 4, and then has like my four or five bucketed priorities. And then the key thing is you have to define success. So in Q1 of next year for my e-commerce business, what does success look like? For me, it's like launching a whole suite of new social campaigns. That's the Q1 measure of success, just getting that done, getting it out the door. So then you go from there and you break down each priority in another table that basically says, why is this important and how am I going to do it? So I've got Q1 priority, what success looks like, and then I've got to take that and say, why do I care about that? Why does it even matter? And exactly how am I going to do it? Oh, I might take an online course. I'm going to read a couple books. I'm going to uh, brush up my design skills, like whatever it is that's going to feed. So that's how it all comes to it. Like today, I'm working on um, writing that first email of this 30-day e-commerce accelerator thing which feeds into my 2X e-commerce program. And I'm starting to, I'm trying to build some buzz and, and attract around that. Man, that's powerful to be able to bring it down to the daily. Like I, that, that's such a difficult, and I saw, I actually saw that now that you said the post and he said in that thread uh, that he kind of built, twisted his own version of EOS mm -hmm. out of traction, which weirdly I, am not a fan or I historically was not a fan of, but like, I'm holding it up. If you can't see the video, like we just finished going through that process for the business yesterday. So it's just funny timing, uh, with, with, with what you're talking about, but cause here's where I struggle. We have our quarterly goals. I don't know what I need to do in three Tuesdays. You know what I mean? On that day too. Mm -hmm. So is it like general, like, you know, I need to write, and then whatever I need to write comes up for that day? Or how, how do you structure that so that the daily is actually laddering up to the, to the bigger quarterly goal? I pretty much think of it as a series of sprints. And for that particular sprint, I got to be focused on whatever that thing is. And yeah. so, yeah, it becomes a little hard. Like a lot of times day in, day out, you're like, am I on track? I, did I actually accomplish anything today? Like, who knows? But, right. but I essentially, my personal belief is that despite how much we all work, I think you've only got three good hours a day, hmm. maybe four, but like three good hours. And for me, it's pretty much going to be like eight to 11 AM or nine, nine AM to noon. Um, yeah. So I, I, I treat that time sacredly and I break it up into roughly one hour sprints. And I say sprint one is Priority one, so e-commerce, mm -hmm. whatever that quarterly goal is. Sprint two is the creative one, so whatever my kind of writing goal is. And sprint three is audience, and to drive whatever my audience goal is, what whatever they may be. I just think in sprints like that, and you know, day in day out, I just need to take one good shot mm -hmm. at each basket. Just just get a repetition in. So something that's important for me. I'm very, very susceptible and influenced by my environment. So I have to be moving around. I work at my office for a minute. I work at the coffee shop for a minute. I hit a different coffee right. shop each, you know, uh, every other day. Uh, I work from home every once in a blue moon, although that's become hard with uh, little kids at home. Yep, um, so e even if I'm doing like something really boring, like nine to 10, this, 10 to 11, that, 11 to 12, and then take a break. I'm going to be doing it at a different place, kind of in a different environment. That's good. This has been good, man. I think, uh, I just know people are going to dig this because of how detailed we're getting with, with some of this stuff and just, um, mm -hmm. how, how, you know, transparent you're being with, with that, which I really appreciate. Um, 
Yeah. So I guess, uh, anything else that you want to throw out there or, or let people know about before we wrap up? Well, um, you know, I talked about what I'm most excited about coming up, which is generally around e-commerce growth and creating some kind of an e-commerce acceleration program for people with really small Shopify stores. This is not like Amazon not doing, this is, right. you know, building an actual brand and presence. So that would be my request to anyone out there. Um, bring me people who would like that or bring me yourself, like DM me, get in touch. Um, let's talk about putting that together or if you want to participate in it or if you know someone who would have an interest in something like that. Um, that's my big request. And you know, of course, I'm on Twitter 24 yeah. seven at Sunny Bird. Hard to spell, S-O-N-N-Y-B-Y-R-D. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate you coming on, Sonny. Thanks for doing this. It was a blast, man. It's great to talk to you recorded and great to talk to you non-recorded. Let's catch up soon. Right. We'll do it again.